of Time Spoilers podcast. And we're going to do a double header today of chapters because we are in a recap of the Fayil kidnapping plot. We're in Perrin's head, but it's all <laughs> recap of the Fayil kidnapping because, but it's the opening of Perrin being in the book. So it's like the recappiest possible recap it could be. So wait, 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 before you go, before you go, um, no, seriously, it's the, there's some interesting stuff in these chapters. It's not, there is some big chunks of recap. But, you know, the the reality is parents' plotline, despite spanning three books, only occurs in a very small number of chapters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They do the montage that lets you know this was happening over all the other chapters, right. but at least you didn't have to see it in all of those chapters. But it also feels like you did in hindsight, because that is how the time <laughs> puddle of Wheel of Time rereads works. <laughs> it does. A parent's plotline does take up a uh, inordinate amount of space in my head. Um, and yet, as I listen back to these books, it seems like I never actually am listening to Perrin do much. I'm like, wait, where's Perrin's plotline again? That's why it's so annoying. He makes a big deal out of it. And we're like, what is there? There's a few chapters. And most of those chapters is you being mad at Bear Lane. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just this chapter. But like so much of his time is spent being mad at Bear Lane. Sometimes he smells dark hounds that have nothing to do with him. Yes, what a thrilling and utterly critical <laughs> plot development. I, ju I just, we're, we're going to blaze through this. We've got some very fun uh, cleansing POV snippets as yes, Sindane and yes. Catswain. That That's fun. Those are what's getting me through these episodes, I tell you that. Yeah, for sure. So what, what order do you think we should divvy these four parts up in? Uh, uh, I'd say we should record... Let's let's. I'm gonna I'm gonna approach it with a um, brain that needs to check things off a list. So I say we blow through the two cleansing POVs and then do the parent chapters, just to get me going on something that's gonna be tasty. Okay, um, all right. Like dessert I just first. I need gotcha. that to get going. <laughs> yeah, dessert first. Um, but you know. Feel free to edit them in any order so that they show up in whatever order we think is appropriate for if there's a relevant way that we discover they should they should show up. Okay, sounds good. Because I, I couldn't think of a particularly artistic order to put them in. So, yeah, let's let's do that then. So do you want to uh, buckle down uh, into no. this parent? No, no, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, yeah, okay, fine. All right, <clears throat> here we go. I'm going to go all like Perrin is a teenager who thinks he's a badass when I read the stuff in italics. <laughs> okay. So everyone buckle up for a double header of chapters five and six of Crossroads of Twilight in Perrin's POV. So chapter five, the forging of the hammer with the symbol of the wolf. At this point, I don't think I have to point out the significance of those two things. No, and it's not the cool <laughs> hammer. Very, very it's rude. the annoying right. hammer of his angst. But yeah, hammer and wolf is mm, on the nose. He ran easily through the night in spite of the snow that covered the ground. <laughs> he was one with the shadows slipping through the forest, the moonlight almost as clear to his eyes as the light of the sun. A cold wind ruffled his thick fur and suddenly brought a scent that made his hackles stand and his heart race with a hatred greater than that for the never born. Hatred and a sure knowledge of death coming. There were no choices to be made. Not now. He ran harder toward death. I cannot! Oh, God. But, like, you know, 
12 year old me was swooning after the 14 year old that wrote that like <laughs> so hard <laughs> Oh, Good man. lord. And that's why I don't read uh, romance novels for a living. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. So, I don't, I don't think I'm going to read any more than that. Yeah, I think that'll do. Um, <laughs> At least yeah. in that voice. So, that's Parents Dream. <laughs> yeah. Parents Dreaming, and he smells, you know, spoilers for the next two chapters. Dark hounds. Yep. In his dream. Basically what happens is some dark hounds were rolling by and we're like, hey, that's a Tavirin. We should check it out. All right. Not our mission. Moving on. And Perrin makes two big ass chapters worth of scaring his people out of that. (laughs) So a couple of big questions. Who were the dark hounds actually looking for? What is going on with Aram? Because we get a lot of references to aram in this chapter and then just straightening out some of the timeline because this is a flashback after a dream inside a nightmare um of a slog so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think the middle question the second question is the easiest to answer what's going on with aram is perrin there's a line in here that i forget exactly what it is but perrin repeatedly brushes off Aram as being hopelessly the way he is and like in- incapable of change and not worth reaching out to or interacting with. This is the moment, I think, when the last possible smidgen of hope for Perrin redeeming Aram is going away. This is when Aram sours on Perrin and becomes open to Masima. Because before, Masima was interesting, but like there was still home, there was still safety. Fayil gets taken. Perrin absolutely falls apart. Aram has no one and nothing. And 22 days later, Perrin continues to give him the cold shoulder and not care about him and dismiss his feelings in every possible way. Like, this is when he he loses his love for Perrin and is like, I'm going to go looking somewhere else, which becomes Masima and the eventual assault on Perrin. I I think that's what the significance of Aram being referenced in this chapter so much is. I mean, I, 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 the only thing I disagree with there is that he, this isn't the thing that starts him going to Masima. He's been going to Masima for a while at this point. You think he's been visiting him at this point? Oh yeah, definitely. Like there's a lot of that sourness and that smell I think is because he's starting to buy into the fanaticism and the religion and the insanity that is Masima. And this is the thing that makes him go, okay, all that stuff Masima has been saying, he's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, it, it's been happening. I think this is the, the, the moment when there's no chance of redeeming it anymore. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause like it was going to be a hard struggle the last 22 days. Any one of those days would have been a real tough sell. But there's there was a chance after after this there isn't right which is a bummer because it's just because Perrin doesn't give him any attention. So this dream is structured that Perrin wakes up from this dream where he smells the dark hounds. So that's the present, mm-hmm. and he goes, okay, it's been twenty two days, and then we get sort of a flashback to those twenty two days and what happened, and then we're back to today at the end of the chapter, and into the next chapter. Yeah, it's it's a montage because there's a lot of recap. There's a lot of reminding us of characters. So it's a very scenic tour kind of like what has Perrin been going through? But also Perrin's so stressed out that things don't have to go in sequence and they don't have to connect logically. Right. Uh, The wolves aren't around because of one would assume the dark hounds. Right, right. Because dark hounds are very dangerous to wolves in particular. They're like Slayer on steroids. I always wanted to make some connection between the wolves or somehow corrupted wolf. Uh, the dark hounds were somehow corrupted wolf souls, but I'm not sure I ever. Oh, yeah, no, we do. Elias says that in like two chapters. Okay. I was listening. I was listening to the book while doing some yard work the other day. Elias absolutely explains that to Perrin um, in a, a chapter or three. Oh, the dark hound souls are corrupted yeah, wolf and souls. And that they can eat 
wolf souls if they're near the mm. point of death and then new dark hounds are born. Um, yeah, it gets laid out quite explicitly. Oh, okay. You are simply remembering okay. canon and assuming it's your own thought. <laughs> yes, yes, I am absolutely remembering uh, canon as head canon. Okay, okay, cool. That's that makes me happy. Yeah. You you know this stuff. You know what's going on. I know this. Yeah, I you don't know, know what's, what's on, on the page, yeah. but you know the world <laughs> <laughs> all too well sometimes. Slightly. But yeah, so basically, when Perrin asks them about the Dark Hounds, they say, "Oh shit, that means the last battle is coming. We don't want to talk about that. We're just going to go sit and think about." The fact that the end of all existence is nigh, which is news to him. He didn't know that the wolves had that sort of lore about dark hounds, which he doesn't know they're dark hounds yet. But like, you know, he puts it together shortly. I I thought he kind of I thought that was more of a recap when they say uh, that's he says like that's what the wolves called the last battle, Tarman Gaiden. He says that like that's a known fact. You know, no, you know, he knows about the last battle, but like the whole like the imminence of it. Like, it's like when mm. he told them about Shadow Killer or when he told them the smell that they labeled Shadow Killer. It kind of reminds me of that, where it's the wolves going, oh, shit, that's one of the signs. You know, like the Amayar. This is not the first sign the wolves have had because we did have that th- instance in book two. But I feel like this is the second time that that's come up to that level of severity with Perrin. The number of people that look at Perrin and go, oh, shit, last battle's coming. <laughs> it's, making, it's making me a little nervous, you know? It's just like, oh, okay. That's, uh, you're, you're pretty obviously one of the signs with the, the hammer and the axe. When are you putting that sucker aside? Just curious, because, you know, yeah, last battle's coming. So, yeah, we get the count. It's been 22 mornings since Fayil was kidnapped, and Perrin has a list of women in his head, not unlike his best buddy Rand, uh, though this list is people who are still alive and that he needs to remember to rescue rather than women who are dead that he refuses to allow have made noble sacrifices. It's slightly different, but it's also like a little the same, a little mm. bit. Yeah. But it allows RJ to give us a page of recap of each of the women, which is useful at chapter five. Not that I think we However, need However, not to useful. Do yeah. No, no. I yeah, don't it's think we do. Yeah. Aleandra, Bain, Chiad, Arella, Lucille, Megden. There you go. Those women. Remember they exist? There we go. Yes. Remember that two of them are queens, one of them in disguise? Remember that two of them are maidens. Remember that two of them are Cha Fayil. Remember that none of them are Fayil, who is nonetheless also there. Okay. That was beautiful. <laughs> Uh, we get a recap about how travel has been real crappy. They like overshot their mission, their, their jumping off point. Right. And I, th- it- I think this is the point of the recap, which is basically to say he was hasty. He was, it's very, you know, loyal, like Ogier, like and his haste ruined the work, right? Like he jumped around too much and basically jumped ahead of where they were and had to go back and backtrack his steps to find out where the path diverged to follow them again. And so now today is the day that he expects to actually yeah. catch up. With and them. again, this reminds me of the great hunt because remember when they start out on the great hunt, the horn itself is going on a zigzag and they have that whole thing with Perrin, like helping them find it. And in that instance, they didn't have traveling, so they couldn't overshoot and jump. They could, but they did still have the the thing where Ingtar like wanted to go ahead in a straight line. He wanted to cut the corner. Yeah, and like, the same thing would have happened, but he was experienced, and so he forced himself to be slow and patient. Perrin is for- faced with literally the same situation, and because he's younger and more inexperienced, he rushes things and screws up in the exact way that Ingtar was trying to prevent in book two. And the fact that he moves his entire army, it's like, dude, send out scouts with the Ashaman, have the Ashaman make a gateway every 10 miles, have the scouts sprint it, look for signs, and then you know where the turn is, and then just keep doing that along the path until you, you never have to move your armies. You could do that in one day and f- figure out exactly where they are. And Rand has figured out how to do that. He yeah. Rand did that in the Shawshank right. campaign. Perrin's over here still doing book two rookie mistakes. Meanwhile, Rand has completely leveled up. He, and he runs his Ashaman Ragged with really inefficient ways of using them. Yeah. Yeah. He He's going to be a lot better at, at this in a couple of years. He's so, so inefficient with running this machine. But yeah. No, I mean, instead of holding one gateway open for hours and hours and hours and hours while his whole army passes through it, just send a soldier through, then close it. 
then open it back up in an hour when they've run 10 miles and back again, you know, like, yeah, I, I don't know. It just, it, it drives me nuts. Yeah, no, it's a complete waste of resources that makes this plot drag out longer. There's a lot to be annoyed about. And then when Sanderson does his, like, red snakes bubble of evil that, like, makes them sick, at that point, I'm just like, come on, parent, just make a gateway home, please. That's, I think, Tower of Midnight yeah, or something. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. That one's so weird. That's a weird one. This one. Like, it's clear that Sanderson was like, fuck, I have to delay him somehow. I need the Ashman to be sick. Bubble of evil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, well, RJ did build in a lot of mechanisms to give himself an out. He certainly did, yeah. Yep, yep. There's no doubt about it. He... He could divert a plot line with the best of them. <laughs> Although I think we're up there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey. yeah. There's also, I think, an interesting parallel between the Shido and the Prophet. The description of them as being human locusts. You know, they're coming behind seeing this locust burned path sort of thing. But also Perrin is bringing behind him these sort of human locusts that leave a burned path. And it's the the two groups are so similar and they're only different because of the dynamic that Perrin and Fael have within them and it, there's just a lot of like internal soul searching hypocrisy happening because our hero is being so nonsense in terms of his standards because he's chasing one set of locusts with another set of locusts he allies with the Sean Chan to fix it but also like what would you do if it was your wife right like we really get to maybe that's part of why we don't like Perrin is because or like in this plot line, not Perrin in general, but like this part of it is because like he's making really shitty decisions in a really shitty situation. Yeah. And it's really hard to approve of them. But also like you don't want to think about the choice you would make. So deflect, deflect, deflect. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, to me, it also feels a little bit like. In so much as, as it's not the best writing, he needs the Sean Chan. And so he is put in a situation where he makes a deal with them. If there's nothing, I don't understand why this feels so slow. It could be really interesting. And so I struggle because I think like he's bonding together all these different groups. And like if he just did it with intention, it would be so much more interesting. I think that's what it is, is he somehow by accident brings. And it's like he's talking about all this very forging metal with intention and with a purpose and with a target and, you know, forging all these people together. And like, I get these forging together to f get Fael, but it, if only it was his intention to forge them together as opposed to just like gluing them together just long enough to do what needs to get done. Yeah. And having sort of a sacrificial bit on the front of it. Like, I would have really loved to see a redemption of these poor, innocent people that were sucked into the prophet's um, clutches and believe his yeah. lies. Instead of just like, oh, yeah, let them get slaughtered by the Shino. That's how we're going to take care of that group of people. It's like, what? Like, show the prophet to be a false prophet. Kill him. Recruit the people and have them, you know, get trained up in the different groups in your army and actually have a useful force out of them. It's the way he writes right, Aram like, off. Aram has one yeah, bad month yeah, same, and he's right. completely written off as a person. Like it's, and I, I think you're totally right. It's the lack of intentionality. Perrin fails upward against his own effort mm -hmm. into being this grand heroic leader who has all these cool people who are super loyal to him and want to follow him. And you never see him earn it. Not once in this whole arc do you see him earn it. But all the pieces are right there and everyone around him sees him as earning it. We as the readers don't, but everyone in the world does. That's very frustrating. And you can thank Berylaine for a big chunk of that. Berylaine and Fail, right? There's certainly the women in his life are the ones who are making this happen, right? Like it's, it's not something he's doing. And, and Berylaine is undercutting him and being slut shamed. Like, in equal measure while she does that, which means that her arc doesn't get to be cool. Because, like, what if her and Perrin had a platonic puzzle-solving experience where they managed to bust Fagiel out and also redeem a bunch of people from the brainwashing they cult? They almost get there. So they almost get there. I'll talk about that more in the next chapter, because that's really when their relationship uh, is on screen. Yeah, and I never really had thought about that with Masima's followers as being redeemable, because I'm... I am easy to write off mobs of people who are 
fascistically <laughs> intent on my death. It's easy to write that off, right? But but when you talk about where they're coming from, yeah, they they are they are cult followers. They are not the same kind of brainwashed people as Natron Sparrow, right? Natron Sparrow people have been fully magically lobotomized. They are already dead, basically. They're casualties right, of totally. war. Perrin and so many people like me are willing to write off these cult followers as a faceless mass who are equally gone, which is like absolutely not true. They are going through a very normal human experience of following a human cult leader and could absolutely be de-radicalized if someone bothered to try. Unless Grendel is doing a low-level compulsion somehow on all... That's what that smell is, that Perrin... That spreading sort of corruption smell is somehow a uh, compulsion to believe in the prophet and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think that seems like way too much effort and way like that. That seems very extreme. It just feels like it's 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 a garden variety cult shit. Like I've yeah. listened to way yeah. too many behind the bastards episodes about various cults and cult leaders. Like this is absolutely garden variety, normal human experience cult shit. I think there's also an interesting parallel between the prophet's people and parents' people, right? Because they both kind of are following belief in a single figure and what he says, and they're doing what he wants. And they are both traveling through a country. They're both, you know, kind of on a holy mission. Um, it, it's amazing how similar those two groups are, while at the same time, we find one to be despicable and evil, because they do despicable and evil things. But yeah, from the perspective of the of the country folk who are having to sell their food or have it stolen from them. Mm -hmm. What good is coin if you're starving? Yeah. And like, I don't know that Perrin ever explicitly says he's going to eminent domain people's food. But like, given that the Aiel and the prophets people are in the mix, it's hard to see how he's not just saying, well, it was at fair market value. Like, it's... I, I don't know, but it's, yeah, we're, the blind faith that us as the readers are forced to have in Perrin and his goodness, because he's the main character of this plot, is complicated. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, look at the survivors. The survivors ran as hard as if Perrin was another Shido, not looking back for fear he was following them. Yeah. Yeah, because he shows up with an army, yellow eyes, a glaring voice, and hands on his axe and says, I need food. Like, mmm. Oh, question. Uh, they cross the Eldar into Altara, and there's a question. How did the Shido get across? He did not know, but he had the Ashman make gateways. How did the Shido get across? I assume that they asked wetlanders who knew about river crossings, like, because they have traders and stuff amongst their guy shine. I'm assuming there was a fording experience. Maybe they built rafts. Maybe they. I, it never gets mentioned. No, well, as far as I can tell. I. There's no, like, Fahil being like, oh, I hated that time when I got wet when they made me ford the river. Right, or that time that they forced us to carry wagons on our heads through the river and eight of us drowned, or there's nothing. Right, yeah, yeah, something like that. No, Robert Jordan just realized that there was a river running right through his plot and had to plaster over it. <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, shit, I put a river there. Uh. Oh, he yada, yada, yada over that one. He's like, and somehow the Shido crossed. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and leave that one. Through. They're resourceful. They figured well, yeah, it out. They, they did it. Well, I mean, because we see the other um, Aiel, right? Does not Rourke say? We uh, made this thing called rafts. We remember wood floats, like smacks a tree. I don't think it's Ruark that says that. I think it's the younger maidens. Or is that but, Gaul? Um, okay. It's in that group that Ruark shows up in. in yeah, okay. uh, Dragon Reborn, I think. Um, yeah, no, it's... But you can't raft families and wagons of goods and provisions and old people across. Like, you have to have something. And, and it's too logistically difficult to think of. So just hand-waving because author rights. <laughs> author privileges. I am going to headcanon that the channeling wise ones created a bridge of air. Totally. I was totally thinking that too. Like, it's not that wide, right? It's fine. No, and it, and it doesn't leave much evidence, right? Something else, everything else would leave evidence. They have all the channelers they need, no matter how weak they are. 
Yeah. I mean, you would end up seeing like the, the tracks of the on ramp off ramp, but, but they could have like gone to a thinner part of the river, a half day upper mm, south. Yeah, rock, or, so rocky yeah, area, yeah, totally, something like that. Totally. Yeah. But yeah. No, it makes sense. Just like slap some channeling planks down. Yeah. You can't fly, but you can do that. We've seen many channels yeah. do that. It only yeah. needs to be like a foot above the river water. Like it's fine. It's totally fine. And then, like, put some, like, cool, like, glowing, like, D&D fairy lights, you know, along the edge. So that way none of the horses just, like, walk <laughs> off the invisible bridge. Right, fall into the right, water. right. <laughs> the, in, in chat, had Ken and the, the Shadow were going to do something really dumb and Fahil save them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. She's like, no, you can't. Oh, you can't carry the things on your heads. It's 10 feet deep. You'll drown. Yeah, something. <laughs> I'm willing to accept that headcanon. Yeah. All right. So uh, as I'm going through, I'm just going to read some quotes the, when describing Aram's scent. Okay. And since Fayil was taken, anger seemed a permanent part of his scent. A great deal changed when Fayil was taken. Just Aram showing up at his tent. Not even his tent. He's just sleeping under a wagon, like a ruffian. Yeah, just sleeping. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And I love his little, he wakes up, he's irritated that it snows, not because he's sleeping in the snow, but because it makes it harder to track the Shido. He is such a wolf. He's a one-track mind, yeah. Such a wash-and-wear outdoor dog. But basically what's happening here is Seven Balwer and Solanda have shown up to give an intelligence report because Balwer is actually getting along pretty good with this whole Chafayil spiring thing, and Solanda is the leader, so this is kind of like him doing sort of a, a field test of her work and seeing how she performs in front of Perrin. And it all goes very well. And he considers her to be like a, a good asset to work with after this interaction. Right. The spy master has his spies. Right. Yeah, totally, totally. But uh, they're here to give an intelligence report about um, a couple of different interesting items that are going to factor into Perrin's blacksmith puzzle for the duration of this plot. And Perrin casually sends... Aram away to fetch his horse like a good little boy, and a jaggedness entered Aram's scent as he trudged her way across the snow. Yep. Not doing a great job there, Perrin. No, he is broadcasting Not doing a great job. that he is deeply unhappy and feels unappreciated and unloved, and and you just could give a rat's ass. So we get this list of three things that are being reported which we should talk about, probably. Yes. The first, that Masima sent another rider back towards Amadisia. So that, I assume, is his contact with the Sean Chan. Yeah, that would make sense, because they are in Amadisia. Right. Um, and we know from the letter we're about to reveal that he is in deep in contact with the Sean Chan, probably with Dark Friends. Right, because remember, Masima is being compelled by one of the Forsaken, I believe, Grendel in his dreams. And so... I can see that the contact and that letter was written at the command of a Forsaken from one dark friend to another. Or, you know, I don't think Masima's actually a dark friend, but he's under the control of the Forsaken. So, you know, dark... Asset? Fiend. Yeah, I don't know what, what do you want to call these, the people who are, like, under compulsion to do whatever a Forsaken wants, right? He, he's basically a dark friend in everything but name. Right. In choice. Right. You, you can use him as a dark friend in terms of planning. Right. Whatever he thinks is going on. <laughs> right. So they, so a Forsaken had Suroth, the deliberate dark friend, send this work with, send messages to interact with the dark friend by default, Masima. Yeah, that makes sense to me because I don't know why Masima and Suroth would specifically interact unless someone higher up the chain was like, you two plot. Yep. Same thing. I mean, we have the same thing with Suroth and uh, Leander. Right, right, exactly. Like what, the dark contacts saying, "Here's who you're talking with on this continent." Right. They didn't know each other beforehand. They were commanded to meet. Yeah, they didn't seek each other out. They were told, "This is what we're doing within the dark levels right, of this right. invasion." So this is this wouldn't be a first thing for Suroth to receive a command directly from a Forsaken to no. do something like that. Agreed. And we know that Masima is directly, you know, under the control of Grendel. She's puppeteering him. So they both have direct contact with Forsaken. I think we have evidence of yeah. that. Yeah. So they might not be getting messages from the same Forsaken. They are doing a little proxy <laughs> war thing between some other yeah, Forsaken. That's yeah, possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it seems reasonable to assume that Masima is, for all intents and purposes, a dark friend, despite what he believes about himself. Which is a little awkward. It sucks when... 
when you think you're a good guy and you're actually a bad guy. I mean, I don't like Masima, but I do feel for him in that regard. And I think that he's gotten another big, strong dose of uh, compulsion because lately the man claimed Masima Dagar was actually dead and risen from the grave as the prophet of the Lord Dragon Reborn. That presumably means he got another big dose of of magic juice in his brain. Right. That he went from the dragon is God to I have been reborn as his prophet. Right. And dragon is God. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, maybe in his dream, he went through what we would recognize as allegorically kind of a baptism, kind of a rebirth that sure. like helps cement his commitment, you know, like. Well, and what couldn't Grendel do to him in the dream with compulsion, make him believe, think, feel, whatever Right, she you wants. walked into a lake of fire and your flesh was burned away and you emerged right. as a glorious phoenix who has been anointed by the Lord Dragon. That would be easy as pie for her to manifest. Even without him being really willing to believe it, it would be easy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, I think he must have gotten an upgrade on his compulsion, given that he's claiming to not be himself anymore because i mean honestly he isn't he the more he gets upgraded no. like that the less he is himself he's a little bit telling us what's going on there yeah masima the soldier and the prophet two very different people the masima the soldier is dead the second that grandall decided to take a hold of him and compel him to do things he became an auto- automaton in his own body who is the prophet of the lord dragon it's a little sad actually and i look forward to hot masima in the show breaking all of our hearts <laughs> so there's some scheme parents always thinking about why is Masima hanging around why doesn't he want to go back to Rand and I was just trying to figure out if you had a good theory as to why in particular Masima was trying not to leave the west or trying not to see Rand like I, you know we've talked about it before because this is something that's come up before but like any any good ideas about what's going on with Masima's plan? No. I I'd, I hope we find a detail somewhere, somehow, that clues us in. But at this point, I got nothing new. So the second thing that Solanda reports is that Masima's people are raiding food from the countryside at Sword Point, which isn't really news. But again, it's a recap chapter, so we have to be reminded what human locust means in a very visceral sense. Right. They offered people a chance to swear to the dragon reborn, and those who refused, sometimes those who simply hesitated too long, died by fire and steel. And this is where, you know, what's your choice? Swear or die. And once you've sworn, it's either be left behind with all your goods and everything to eat gone, or follow them. Yeah. And become a member of the army, right? It's not like, a choice. Basically, your only choice is death, 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 or join Masima's army. Which will probably lead to death, but slower. Yeah. You'll you'll live longer if you join up and stay with right, your food, right. basically. So that's what I'm saying. Like, it just, it seems like a, a pretty unfair choice to condemn these people, considering what choices they were given. Right. They aren't even all necessarily fully into the cult following aspect of it. They're just in the, no. I don't like starving aspect of it. Yes. Yeah, and but they're poor and dumb and they shouldn't have followed him. And and they were present when a war crime was committed. So fuck 'em. Little fucking classist and and individualistic parent, my dude. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying I, I feel bad when parents people get slaughtered. I don't fi- or when uh Masima's people get slaughtered. I don't find it the victory that the books make it out to be. They should have been parents people. They should have been parents, people. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, kneel or you will be knelt. Like, this Mm. is not the victory you think it is. Like, this is dark. Like, oh, we got rid of Masima's people. How convenient. Like, no, that's that's dark. Mm -mm. That's bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is the worst outcome. But yeah, no, that like the 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 wise ones and parents getting together, being like, yeah, just stick them in the front. 
Yeah. We're not going to lose anybody. And then, and then when they hear, when they win the, the battle of Malden, and basically the tea works great, and the Masima's people take all the casualties, they're like, yeah, we basically lost all of Masima's people other than a ha- scattered handful. Oh, but what about real casualties? Oh, we only had like a handful of those. Best battle plan I've ever seen. Pulled it off without a hitch. Only a few real ca- And it's like, Masima's people were wiped out almost to a man. Because they had the misfortune of being poor farmers in his or being people in his way. But a lot of them are poor farmers because he's sweeping through the countryside. So a lot of those people are exactly who would be cannon fodder in the real world. That's I've never really thought about the insane inhumanity that Perrin's army and his advisors and he display there. I am guilty of being one of them. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I mean, I understand why. They, they they are infected with a idea, a mental disease. I could see, especially in modern times, where you'd be like, God, that whole group of people, like, I just, there's no redeeming them. Yeah. That idea is, just needs to be wiped out, and anyone who has it is not worth trying over. Yeah. That that level of existential polarization is way too recognizable. Yep. Thanks, RJ. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> that we both go silently on the distance, like, oh shit! What do we? What do we? What do we just unearth now? Mm, so, um, uh, not good. Um, uh, the 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 third thing. The third, the third, the third plot. The thing, third thing um, is that Masuri and Anura have been visiting Masima, and I still, after all these rereads, don't understand how these meetings started or what they are intended to accomplish. I think th- th- it was Aiel. Sorry, I think it was Aes Sedai attempting to manipulate rulers and people of power like they always do no matter how insane they might be because they can't smell how insane he actually is they are attempting to manipulate and control and they think there's a chance for redemption uh and they take it why is Masima willing to entertain meeting with them given how he feels about Aes Sedai because I think some of that is an act I think the Aes Sedai are the bad guys this is um, okay, so I, I actually did bring up a quote. This is actually about the Forsaken, but this is this is irrelevant here as well. I think out, this is Robert Jordan talking. Anybody out there ever read about the internal workings of the Third Reich of the re- or the reasons why the Nazis made some of the major and often disastrous decisions? It was a zoo, a madhouse. Just for an example, even in the last days, they were sidelining trains carrying desperately needed supplies to the front in order to use the engines to transport more people to the death camps. And yet they came within a whisker or two of winning. Uh, It goes on for a while. But basically, you know, he's basically saying evil internally is a mess. Nothing ever goes the way it's supposed to. People are meeting with people. You know, they think they can control and manipulate to get what they want. And um, that's kind of what I think he's trying to do here is real fog of war stuff with all these people just meeting with other people for no reason. You know, it's true that like almost all of the super Nazi high command, even up to and including Hitler, helped some of their Jewish friends get out before the Holocaust. Like, well, sure. Those are the those are your friends. Those are the good ones. That's that's how this works. You know that, right? right? So I'm I'm sitting over here being like, well, Messina believes his own act, and it's like Hitler believed his own act too. But that doesn't mean that you're not totally correct that it is an act, and that it's more complicated behind closed doors. And that he's willing to talk to someone if it gives him more power or gives him control or if it gives him insight and you know maybe he's trying to convince them that Perrin's the dark friend with the, the eyes and they should take him out right like oh my god that's totally what's going on he's totally willing to talk to anyone who might possibly unravel Perrin's maybe that's the whole reason why he doesn't want to see Rand maybe it's not about not seeing Rand maybe it's about staying close enough to Perrin to unravel his army from the inside yeah, I mean, it's basically everything that Aram goes ranting to Perrin about is the stuff that Masima is spouting about Perrin. And I assume he's spouting that to everybody who comes near him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, and, and of course, <laughs> yeah, you make a good point, Jedi Pants. The Rand in Masima's head in his dreams is Grendel, and she could be saying, I don't need you here, you stay there, right? Like, 
He could just be doing that at, he could be staying behind at command. Rand's command. The real dragon's command. Yeah, exactly. It's not, in, in Masima's mind, it is not about avoiding Rand. Perrin thinks right. that it's about avoiding Rand. It's not. It's about sticking close to you, my guy. Presumably, yeah, at, at fake Rand's orders. But, yeah, and, and yeah, it totally makes sense that that's why he would be willing to talk to anyone from Perrin's camp who makes an overture. Because that's a way to get to Perrin, ultimately. Uh, there's a little bit here where Perrin kind of feels guilty about using the Chafael as their eyes and ears. But then he's like, yeah, but ever since that little matter of the broken crown that Elias had let slip, uh, he's like, so he, that's basically Perrin finding out about the, the broken crown of Saldea that she is basically, you know, two deaths away from being queen of Saldea. No, 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 no. So I wanted to ask you about this because he learned that in Shadow Rising. I don't think he did. No, he did. Because that's what in the wagon when he's got the arrow in his side, that's when he insists on learning who her father is. And I thought that in the course of learning that her cousin is a queen, he asks her how far away she is from. The, I, I swore that that was part of the discussion in Shadow Rising. Was how far away she was from, or how close she was to the throne. Because I've never understood this line here from Elias. I don't, I don't, I've never understood what the little matter of the broken crown is because I thought that was covered in TSR. It's, it's one of Min's viewings in the eye of the world, right? She sees him with a broken crown. Um, it's mentioned by Davron Bashir in Lord of Chaos, but I don't see anything from the great the shadow really? rising there's nothing about the succession i mean the name of the crown but that's not a thing that's likely to bother perrin let me do a quick search hold on i love it that you have the ebooks searching broken crown in the shadow rising well she might not have called it the broken crown but like she definitely mentioned that she was like two deaths away from the throne i thought all right here it is um in shadow rising my father is Davram of House Bashir, Lord of Bashir, Tyre, and Sidonia, Guardian of the Blight Border, Defender of the Heartland, Marshal General of the Queen Tenobia of Saldea, and her uncle. So, yeah, I don't know. No. I mean, that's that seems to be very obviously like, yes, I am related to the king and queen and in that line of succession. I've just been mandala affecting myself into this line not making sense for years. But, you know, you know I, th I think you've got a point. I, th I really do. I think the idea that the broken crown is something that is is unknown to him seems weird because he's if he knows what the crown of Saldea is, then he knows about the broken crown. Right. He knows that she's cousin to a queen. Like, he knows that. So I don't see what maybe it's just that Elias explained that Tenobia doesn't have heirs. And stuff mm, like may maybe something. maybe it's just that Elias kind of was like, no, you don't understand the specifics of this family tree. But I I could have done with more exposition on that instead of on being reminded of how much we need to slut shame Barrelane, RJ. Just saying, a little more exposition on the actual succession crisis of a country other than Andor would have been fun. What you don't enjoy learning about how Elaine becomes queen and no other, and and that's how we learn how everybody else becomes king or queen because they just show up and then they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm the new ruler now." Yeah, no, you're right. Every single country in the whole world is just a knockoff version of the British monarchy. <laughs> I mean, the Andorran monarchy. That is definitely how things work. <laughs> um. Okay, so Perrin sends everyone away. Aram comes back. Oh, and then here's here's the next good good uh, Aram line. His scent grew spiky again and quivery, a thin, sour smell. This time, Perrin recognized the scent, though he paid it no more mind than usual. That's why you're losing him, Perrin. You're paying the scents no more mind than usual. The man is your age. You think he can't have, like, potential to change? Like, you're just writing him off. It's the only like, line I highlighted on two I, pages. I am just, yeah. Ugh. My, my, new, my new way of describing Perrin is an um, autistic empath. Yeah. 
He can under he can know what the the emotion is. He just doesn't understand how that person processes it, or how what it means to them. Yeah. See, my he can like. Yeah. yeah. My solution to that was to just want to be an actor, and so that way your entire job is to know how to express emotions and emote accordingly when people have them. Perrin never wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a blacksmith. This is why he didn't learn masking correctly. Mm-hmm. He wanted to work in the back of the house, keep his head down. Yeah. Hammer on some metal and not interact with people. Taviran is not letting that happen. No. Taviran is... He's like, that's Taviran my job. Taviran is ableist. <laughs> I'm deciding. It's like, listen, I know that this job would be a little stress... Uh, a job that you could do from home and it would be really creative but I need you to be a middle manager okay like that's that's the only way you're going to be able to support your family and keep the forsaken from killing them is I need you to manage this army of people you're not going to be the, the hero you're not going to be like on top you're not going to be the in charge you're going to just manage those people for Rand does that sound good? sounds not like what I asked for Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Perrin. Okay, so Perrin goes marching through the camp. Everyone realizes that they need to tear down their... They need to get ready to go for the day. We get a view of the defenses and how he's more afraid of Masima than being attacked by anything else. Some people have died from, you know, disappeared. Eight manors in the last two weeks and nine Gal- Galdean. Yeah, Gildanen. We also have the Aiel, who have, of course, only Gaul as a male Aiel who is not Gaishine, which is always fun. Oh, I have a new favorite pun. How did the pattern pick out its savior? Uh, I just picked some random guy. Rand. Uh, uh, uh. Random. Seriously, I think it's how I think it's how uh, Robert Jordan picked the name of his character. Because if you go back and you look at origins, Rand is one of the few names that we don't have any source for, and it's a name he used in one of his earlier novels. I literally think it was a placeholder because it was a place. He's like, I'm just going to use some random name, and he puts Rand in there for random because that's a variable name used in programming. And Jordan was a programmer. He was a scientist. He would have known that. And so I literally think he substituted in Rand as a variable to indicate random. It could be random protagonist. It's it's basically like heroes naming your main character hero. Remember they did that in the TV show? Uh, over my head. No. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So yeah, uh, Perrin is rushing around. We, we get another panorama of characters. We've got the Two Rivers men. We've got the Andoran crowd. Yeah, the folk that, the folk that followed Queen Morghais, right? They go through that whole list. Yeah, we would get reminded about how Perrin has this besmirched reputation about sleeping with Barrelane, and everyone hates him for it, and he feels sad about it. And So that takes up like two pages. Right. And then Balwer, oh, yeah, Balwer's still walking with him this whole time. And then he finally gets to start digesting the news with Perrin. Now that they're far enough away from people, yeah. Yeah, and they, they kind of disagree about the news. I, I love the part where Perrin says, well, I could just ask Masuri what she's doing, and Balwer, like, physically responds, like, with pain. Like, <laughs> that's like, too gags. forward. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> like, no. You'll reveal all our spies. Destroys and like, him. Yeah, you'll ruin everything. Yeah. And he's like, maybe you should. And, and Perrin's like, ooh, I've got a puzzle. I can't just smash puzzle. Darn yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a fun little little physical comedy of the most subtle man just being like you would just say it straight out like let me just go die in a corner. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, that's I think the best part of parents' chapters is the reactions and the what people are doing around him because again he doesn't notice so you have to read into what's actually going on because he's he sees but he doesn't notice. Right, right. Yeah, and then. They get to the end of that interaction. And so basically Perrin gives Balwer permission to send spies amongst the Aeel. And then he tells Balwer, by the way, I can see that you guided me to this decision. Please be more straightforward. To which Balwer has a different visceral response, which is one of pleasure of being of seeing himself actually being acknowledged for how smart he is. Because Pedro Niall was like, 
sit down, shut up and do my paperwork. And Balwer had to like really subtly manipulate him to do stuff. And like to a certain extent, he was being acknowledged in his talents, but also he was being used in a in put in back in a box. Whereas Perrin is like, just tell me what you want me to do and I will use it in a straightforward manner without subterfuge. Like you can t- take that 10% of your brain power that you're putting on masking and just put it into hyperfocus. And, and Balwer right. is like, thank you. It's it's a very it's a very different physical reaction than the one he had to Perrin being like I'm going to be straightforward. Balwer's like no, don't you dare. But when Perrin says, "Could you please be straightforward with me?" Balwer's like, oh, "Okay, cool. We're our relationship is getting up to to that level. We're on a first name basis. We're about to start farting in front of each other. Like the intimacy is getting real. You know, you know how it is in relationships." Um, sure. <laughs> 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 I don't know what you do in your relationship, uh-huh. but yeah, uh, uh-huh. yeah. no, I, I know what you mean. Um, it is. It's it's a nice little. Hey, I like you, boss. You've been doing a good job, and it it also is sort of a counterpoint to all him being like, "Oh, I'm doing a terrible job. I'm hyper focused." Like, yeah, you're hyper focused, but like you're actually doing a lot of good things in that hyper-focus. You're not just sending us directly into the teeth of the Shido thinking that's going to work. You know, that's I think that's what everyone's, like, really afraid of, is like, oh, he's going to catch up with the Shido and just, like, run down the hill screaming with a hammer. And that's the exact opposite of what he does. Does He finds them with precision at a distance. He sets up an incredibly sophisticated trap, gathers allies, and then takes them out. It takes for fucking ever, but it's a very, very clever way of going about thinking about out a superior force. Yeah, I mean, he's a blacksmith. He understands leverage and using mechanical advantage to do things with metal that a human shouldn't be able to do. Like, he understands how to do a Rube Goldberg. It's just really emotionally fraught. Uh, We did miss one Aram quote where basically... We're hearing about Nora and her going to the to Masima. Aram says, I told you the Aes Sedai couldn't be trusted. I told you that, Lord Perrin, which I think is funny because they're doing the exact same thing he's doing, which is going to Masima. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Hypocrites. The stink of fury from him was so strong that Perrin had to exhale to clear his lungs. He's so angry he wasn't listened to. So angry. Yeah, furious, like soul boilingly furious. Like I've been that mad, but it was like at my teacher or my stepmom. Like it's different when it's a man with a sword who's asking you for help in all but words. And then, of course, I, I love the ending quote of this chapter. I don't trust him, Aram muttered, staring after Balwar, and I don't trust Silanda and that lot. They'll throw in with a die, said I, you mark my words. You have to trust somebody, parents said roughly. The question was, who? Swinging into Stepper's saddle, he booted the dun in the ribs. A hammer was useless, lying at rest. A hammer is useless, lying at rest. It's like the alcohol does me no good in the can. <laughs> the tea does me no good in the cup. Mm-hmm. In chapter six. <laughs> The scent of a dream. So the scent of a dream from the previous chapter, which is part of the reason why this is just a one, two, uh, doing this all at once, because this is, a con- again, a continuation of the previous scene. Actually kind of a light on details chapter as well. Yeah, there's even less to say about this chapter than the last one, because it literally is just continuing the scene, continuing the thread, continuing the event continuing the relationships the one time tinker did not speak but eddie's in the icy air brought his scent a melange of anger and suspicion and disgruntlement yeah neon sign yeah error error man hates you man's angry man's disgruntled not happy with your management or what you're doing with him like you know we can sing parents praises in one moment in terms of bringing everybody together and giving them direction but also be like you are totally failing Aram. In the same moment. He 
just gave a compliment to Balwer and was like, hey, I appreciate your work. Why can't you be that nice to Aram, the man who you saw mm-hmm. deal with mm-hmm. like the worst possible grief right. and who you helped like separate himself from his community and you've decided, oh, he doesn't have a good attitude today, so he did fuck him. He doesn't deserve any compassion from me. Balwer, this random guy who clearly has an ulterior motive, him I can take the time to compliment. You know what I think it is? I think Perrin hasn't dealt with the, the axe hammer dichotomy inside of him. And until he does, he can't he doesn't like something about Aram, and that's that Aram's picked up the sword and chosen the axe. Chosen the violence chosen the killing over the way of the leaf, the hammer, the hammer, at least, which has a possibility of forging something together. It doesn't have to be a killing machine. And so he sees that in Aram and he doesn't know how to deal with it because he hasn't dealt with it in himself yet. And it won't, he won't until he cuts off the hand of the Shido. Yeah. And also in a way, it's like he failed Aram. And every time he looks at Aram, he's seeing a dead man walking, right? Because Aram, the tinker died. Aram's innocence yep. as a Tuathan died. His faith in the way of the leaf died. Like Perrin was that idealist of like, I want the world to be a place where the way of the leaf is safe. Aram is living, breathing representation of his failure to make that happen. And so he takes it out on Aram because fairness is a thing. I see there's a mention of a black wing jackdaw, which I had to bring up just because of um, last year's Watt Idol video that we did. Which had us singing Jackdaw into the screaming <laughs> oh, Jackdaw. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 yeah I, I threw it into the, the curse word slurry at the end. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. And then I had to ask what is a hunting pine marten, a deeper black than the darkness, cautiously raising its head on another, another branch? A uh, pine marten is a kind of like weasel. Okay. Yeah, it's um actually it is what Pantalaimon turns into at the end of his dark materials. He becomes a pine marten. Oh, okay. Didn't know that. Yeah, but it's it's a sort of ferret kind of creature, dark furred, like about as long as one's arm. There's uh, one of Brandon's coworkers actually studies uh, pine martens because they're like an indicator species in forest ecology, something something. So not fictional. Nope. Nope. Very, very real. Very real. <laughs> okay. Despite the fact that pantalimon is fictional. All right. Wh- what? Sorry. Sorry. Nope. That's totally, it's totally real. Just alternate, alternate dimension. dimension. Yes. True. Alter- yep. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. Yes. God, don't, don't try and ruin my, you know, I read nonfiction too. You know what? You're right. You're super, you know, there's a documentary on Netflix <laughs> so- about that series. I did, you know, I was considering yeah. watching it, but, uh, you know, I fell asleep to documentary series. It's. So the, the, the documentary crew did a really good job <laughs> with that, with keeping themselves out of the way. Like, are, are you sure some scenes aren't recreations? It's an actual like documentary of what happened in the moment. I mean, I'm pretty sure that it's like a real documentary. It is shot for shot exactly what the book said. So. Mm-hmm. Cause I really love li- li- reading these historical documents, right? Because it's, you know, I mean, I guess it's hard to really call them historical documents when it's a tale yet to come and a a tale also long past. But, you know. Yeah. I mean, Rand fades to myth and even myth becomes a variable when the typewriter that gave it birth (sighs) comes again. (laughs) Anyway. That was... Impressive. Yeah. Okay. Well, back to the books. <laughs> anyway. Oh, wow. Those are fun little mm. diversions. So he gets to... Uh, uh, he, this is just like, oh my God, how do I even talk about this? He finds tracks in the stone and follows the smell and the tracks around. Yep. He sees footprints in the stone. He sends Aram back to the camp with news that dark hounds are here. He follows the tracks and determines that they have circled the camp. And by the time that he has followed the tracks around the camp, all of the relevant counselors and advisors and busybodies have arrived at the first rock with Aram. And they are all clucking like chickens about the Dark Hound footprints. And we get a fun info dump about them from Anora. And there's another Aram when he sends him away, you know, he turned back towards the camp trailing smells of umbrage and hurt. Umbridge and hurt. Like, 
say something nice to the man. Yeah, no, nope, not gonna happen. Yeah, actually, we don't get the we don't get the Anora info dump until the next chapter. That happens later, but it's it's just pages of of nothing, pages of nothing. Um, oh, I do want to point out. I do want to point out that he, Perrin says at one point that he thought he had killed one once with three broadhead arrows. And we know that, no, you, you didn't come close to killing one. Rand chopped them into little itsy bitsy pieces with the sword and they flowed back together. And, and that's where there's always been the speculation that there are, in fact, oh, two breeds yeah. of dark owls. There's the lesser and the greater dark I hate dark that, owls. but oh, yeah. The lesser... D- the lesser dark hounds fall to more common weapons. The greater dark hounds can basically ooze back together, um, unless you have something that's magically either Balefire or something like Mahalanar. I forgot about that. I hate, I hate it. it. That's why I, I forgot it. about it. Because yep. I hate it. I reject it. Yeah, right. I reject it like I reject the Lanfear reveal. It's like, I don't care if you say it's true. It's wrong. <laughs> Not my wheel of time. It's mine now. <laughs> right, right. No, so I, I always imagine that they need to be bail fired out of existence or else they're not going to be killed. Yeah, that's what I prefer is dark hounds just don't fall to mortal yeah. weapons. They're like, you know, they're like, well, not exactly like this, but, you know, shadow creatures. They can be immune to steel. Right. Like, they only right. influence right. stone. Why not be immune to metal weapons? And they can, like, only be beaten to death with a club or something. Something like that. Yeah, or that makes sense. Salt to me. in their ears. Maybe that is the only way to kill them. That would right. be fine. I'd be fine with that. Or iron instead of steel, like with the. Sure, uh, yeah. sure. Totally. Totally. Like only special weapons. That'd be fine. But don't make two different breeds because you forgot your own cannon. That's just lazy. Yep. Okay, so. Yep. The only thing to speculate about with this big pack is who are they hunting, right? What are their possible goals in passing south past parent do do we see dark hounds show up in anywhere else farther south like do they ever run into like matt and the band not that i can figure out <sighs> right it's, it's a little frustrating uh, again, I'll, I'll reference Watwicky. Possibilities include Matt, Noel, Fane, or perhaps Rand. And I'm just like, mm, mm. I mean, Matt was is kind of in Ebudar, is south of where Perrin is right now. Noel is with him. Fane, who knows? I mean, Fane was last seen in Farmatting, and we're not going to see him again until the last battle, so he could be anywhere. They never, you'd think that this many dark hounds, and Nora makes a big deal about how many dark hounds there are. You'd think this many dark hounds would make an impact on some plot somewhere. I think RJ just like they've rolled under the couch and he forgot about them. Do you, th- and it doesn't seem like they're heading for Rand because I, I wouldn't necessarily call Shadow Logoth south of Giladon. No, it's more like east. Right, right. So it doesn't feel like they're heading towards the cleansing. Maybe they're scouting for Grandall's dream spike trap. They're just doing terrain recon. Not that many. Not yeah, that many. like maybe I, honestly, Fane feels like the best bet because it's like Fane has gone rogue and started acquiring powers outside of the Dark One's wheelhouse. So maybe pitching all the extra Dark Hounds that haven't been used in centuries at him and then he like absorbs them and that's why we never hear about them because he just like makes them part of himself and gets stronger. Like, I mean, he never is seen with them, but like trying to find Fane almost makes more sense than trying to find any of the boys. Or maybe Slayer? Is Slayer, like, calling them and directing them? But you'd think that he'd use them for something. He doesn't. Right, yeah. You'd think as, as someone who's reading... So I'm just doing some research while I try and see if I can find anything. I think Slayer mentions not being into Dark Hounds at some point. Like, that he can't kill them, or they're no fun to kill, or they're too dangerous to hunt, or he avoids them. I feel like he makes an offhand comment about not interacting with them, but I could be wrong. Fane seems to be the best possibility. And that would have been a cool scene to watch him just absorb all the dark hounds. Because doesn't he have some corrupted dark hounds? You know, I don't, I don't recall one way or another. I feel like you might be right that there's a mention of weird thrall dark hounds because... Matt mentions that there's like thrall 
humans and Trollocs. I think humans and Trollocs both. So, like, I'm not sure. Certainly Shadow Spawn. Yeah, I'd have to go back and read that section again and see if uh, they mention Dark Hounds. Because it's a short little section, right? He's not on the no, field for very long. one of the most disappointing parts of the entire last battle. <laughs> I have my whole summary to rewrite that. I thought, you know what would be actually even cooler? Is if he had to give his luck back to Fane to kill him. And then when he reabsorbed Mashadar, instead of killing him, it burned out the memories. <gasps> So he's just back on the road without luck and without memories. And he doesn't know two on, just... and so he can walk away from that whole relationship with a clean conscience. <laughs> <laughs> I just meant Aww. his old man memories, not his like. No, I life love memories, that though. Sure. It removes yeah. it. It's like yeah. Rand losing the ability to channel. It just gets gets blanked out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, he, and then his connection with the Finn is severed. He can feel like his life is his own. For the rest of his life, because mm-hmm. the Finn can't see him anymore, presumably, if, if that happens. Oh, I like that. He actually gets a little personal benefit on the way out. <laughs> but then he has to survive the Shanchen Empire without his luck or his memories. Yeah, he's got his wits and his charm. He'll be fine. That's, that's where the Outrigger novels come in. Then he no, he's no longer safe for the Outrigger novels. And, and Tuan doesn't think she needs him because she's pregnant and no pregnancy has ever gone bad only a week into being known about. So she clearly doesn't need him. So it's fine. <coughs> Elaine. <laughs> I like that. That would be... That'd be you, you've got to rewrite this at some point. Give it to a proper fic writer and like actually work it up because... Oh, God. I, I have a bunch of the scenes in my head. I know exactly how they would be written. I've read enough Robert Jordan now that I think I could. I don't think I can duplicate it is the problem. I think I could read it and be like, that's right or that's wrong. I mean, you could lay out a sketch and then hand it off to some other people who would be like, well, that's wrong and that's wrong. And by the time it gets back to you, it actually looks something like RJ. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Yeah. In my free time. <laughs> All that free time you've got. Okay, so back to the book. Back to the book. So Perrin is is riding along and notices people and is like, I would like to avoid them. And then the people see him and he's like, oh, no, I can't avoid them. And then Berylene rides out with espionage and also food because he desperately needs intel and also calories. And it's a whole awkward thing, but also really important for him to feed himself and get this note because this note allows him to requisition a storehouse full of fork root. Um, there's this, this point where the wise ones spot him and he was surprised the wise ones had, but then Aiel generally had sharp eyes. Is that, I was trying to make that significant that like the, the wise ones would spot him in light that he was like, even he wouldn't necessarily have seen. They probably channeled one of them probably embraced the source and like did the eye sharpening of embracing the power, not even channeling like. One of those were like, oh, there's a shadow over there. I think I'll embrace the source real quick and be like, yeah, golden eyes. It's Perrin. I mean, he's easy to spot. The eyes do the glowy thing. When he mm. turned wolfy, he got that layer in the back of his retina that makes his eyes flash in the dark. I'm headcanoning that. Because Carell is the one who spots him, and I was try- looking her up, trying to make it significant that like maybe she healed him, and so she like. Oh, that would have been a good callback. That, that would have like, been cool, right? Wouldn't that have been a good? That, that would have been great if that's what she. Uh, that's how she sensed him, but no, nothing like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's anything to it other than flavor text to fill up all the space because these books are too short. I really want a roasted wood hen delivered to me in a basket. One thing that's going on between. Uh, I think Fael, sorry, between Berylaine and Perrin right now is that she's not hunting him. Mm -hmm. She's actually worried about him. She's looking at him being like, you look like shit. We depend on you. We need you to get your shit together, eat something and take a bath or else this camp is going to fall apart. Now smile and laugh because I don't want people to know that I am telling you to take a goddamn bath. And yeah, we can pretend we're flirting. Like, this is that one time where I think she's actually in it for his good. She's making sure that he doesn't fall apart while he's making sure the camp doesn't fall apart. She's doing the right thing here. And it's based on her smell. Today, she gave off no hunting scent, not a whisker of it. She smelled patient as a stone and amused with undercurrents of fear. The fear is the fact that he's kind of falling apart. Yeah, I agree with all of that, except I think that it's more than just her fears of his leadership falling apart. It's 
also the super secret note that she's sneaking him and the Masima factor. I think that's oh, a big sure. part yeah. of it. But yeah, I completely agree with everything else. She is like, the Perrin said, I'm not willing to acknowledge the game. And she's like, all right, hold my beer. I'm going to double down. And then like, Perrin is just falling apart. And she's like, oh, fuck, I guess I have to stop playing the game. Even though I said I wasn't going to stop playing, I have to. I have to put a pause on this because I literally I'm driving everything into the ground if I don't like switch over to this like amused caregiver and like and she's giving advice on like Perrin, your wife isn't going to want to be rescued by this. This is disgusting. You need a bath. <laughs> like it's great. And I, she suggests a bath and he says, um, I wash what I can't. Uh, it, besides, nobody else smells any better than I do. Berlin's eyes widen momentarily in startlement. And he goes, why? And as far as I can tell, the only thing that she's reacting to is him literally saying, I don't smell. Everyone else smells as bad as I do. And she's like, no, no, they do not. Oh, this isn't the leg bone biting part. This is this is before. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure that he stinks so bad because he's like freaking out like anxiety does not have the same body odor smell as just a good day's hard work of exertion. Like, very, very different body chemistry when you are just chronically stressed out. Like, he stinks so bad. Also, he's sleeping in all of his clothes under a wagon. And eating is a chore, so he's not eating regularly. So he's probably either constipated or... Yeah, yeah no, no, he's not doing good. He is not a pleasant person to be physically proximate to right now. And then he resents her for sounding like his wife. And it's like, because you forced her to step into the role of being your wife. A caretaker. Yeah. Like, she's being forced to carry that, like, seven-eighths of the role situation because you are doing such a bad job that even the, the, the trollop that's being used or that's using herself, blah, blah, blah. Like, she's literally the only one who's keeping this together. She's effectively your your working wife, which is why it's like, okay, the pattern was clearly setting up a fallback in case Fayil did die. The pattern was like, oh, no, 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 no. If, if sure. Fayil does die, Perrin is going to need someone to put him back online when he falls apart. We're just going to set up Barrelane first, make sure she's there just in case. She's practicing. She's literally practicing for if Fayil doesn't make it out of Malden. I think it's funny that, and I think I've said this before, that Rand gets three girls. Perrin basically is with two because I count Berylaine, mm-hmm. even though she ends the up Hawk with and the you know, Gollum it's a at the end. Thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a mix. And, and Matt, the womanizer, is the one who's like married to just one woman <laughs> at the end. <laughs> I'm super down with that interpretation. A three, two, one. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, Matt has visions that relate him to one woman, whereas Perrin very distinctly has a vision that relates two women to him equally, which is why they should have been a thruple. They would have been so powerful yep. as a thruple. So, I mean, and that's that almost, I think, was part of my theory uh, while I was reading this chapter, is that one of the reasons Barry Lane's not pursuing Perrin is because it's the the pursuit of Perrin is entirely to seduce Fael. Yes, because it's an enemies to lovers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. And that's the way it should have been written in the end. Is that just Fael has two lovers and Perrin is just like not involved with Berlin at all. I want a bisexual Fael queen with her two arm candies. <laughs> She's just like yes. Yeah, she's like, Perrin, I love you, but uh, yeah, I, I just you aren't quite <laughs> enough. I just like I yeah. need someone who actually gives a shit about the political stuff and the domestic household stuff, and like all uh-huh. the things I've trained for. Like, oh my god, the two of them. I need help running. Yeah, uh, Saldea. Exactly, yeah. and like then they'd have a great relationship with Maine, like politically mm-hmm. and for trade. Like, if, oh, mm, mm. And then you get the three nations all together, yeah. right? Because they each represent a nation. Two rivers, Saldea and yeah. uh, Mayan. Mayan. It, uh, the potential, the outrigger potential. I mean. Mm. Right. And they kind of surround Andor, which is this internal powerhouse, right? Like, one's to the south of Andor, one's to the north. Right. It needs to be taken down a few pegs. Like, honestly, Britain. Yep, totally. Down. Totally. And And they kind of form a bit of a barrier between... Sean Chan. So they sort of are this barrier between Matt on one hand and then Andor, which more represents like Rand mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, his mm-hmm. crew and the Aiel yeah, over there. Nice band. It's like Neapolitan ice cream. That's yeah. Beer and boys. Right. 
<laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt has to make his way in the world without luck uh, in the Sean Chan Empire and somehow stop slavery while Perrin is acting as the buffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I know how to write these yeah. books if I was a writer. I believe yeah. in you. <laughs> <laughs> so I love how he gets like grease spots all over this like uber important document. The coffee stains on the really important weather report. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. It's it's a touch of realism. And the the letter itself says, the bearer of this stands under my personal protection in the name of the Empress. May she live forever. Give him whatever aid he requires in service to the Empire and speak of it to none but me. By her seal, Surath Sabel Meldareth of Asin Bayar and Barsaba. Hi, lady. Good job on the pronunciations. Kate Redding, Michael Kramer. They are God. They really are. And I think in the beginning, they're thinking about, like, using it as evidence is really important to evidence. So, like, oh, we're going to use this against Masima. Like think, you were saying, expose yeah. him as a false prophet. Right. Exactly. That would have been great. But instead, they use it to actually, like, get the fork root. They use it for its purpose, which is because it doesn't specify Masima. So, in, in a way, it actually kind of is useless evidence because it's like, well, whoever's holding it is technically the holder of. Yeah, there's like, no way to prove it came from Masima. Right, right. I, I, I thought about that when he like hands it over to the Sean Chan to look at it. If they're like, ah, I have this now. Now you have to do what I say. <laughs> That's not <laughs> like, how those documents work. <laughs> but yeah, it's in terms of proving to Masima's people that he's a fraud. Like, that's not really compelling evidence. Right, yeah. It's really not, because it literally doesn't have a name on it. It's not like Masima on the envelope yeah. would be good enough. I also noticed that the seal is like either like a Buddha hand, like kind of lotus thing with like the two fingers up, or it's like the, the devil horns, like heavy metal, like either way. With the four finger and yeah. little finger raised and all the others so it, it's like It could be kind of more of like a Buddha thing, you know? But if you fold the thumb over, then it's really like devil horns. And they're all, it's like the three of them are connected like this. Oh, like that? So one, two, three. Yeah. I know, great podcast content, but. Huh. Sort of raise your devil horns in two hands and then put your pointer fingers together. And then imagine somebody else doing that on the other side and putting the. Oh, see, I imagine them as like layered on top of each other and having a much more like oh, like like WWW yeah, and having it be style. more of a, like psychedelic layered like Hindu with God with the zillion arms kind of you know I was I was am really seeing it in terms of like a Hindu temple kind of thing, but um, I, the the description is not clear. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll see it in the show uh, one day. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, We're not going right. to get cool Sean Chan seals in the show. We're going to get like one seal for the Andorran Royal House, and that's going to be it. I mean, the problem is they just haven't preserved enough lore to actually have like this house or that house yeah, or this exactly. seal or that like, seal. Not... And, they, and they use a ton of ton of imageries that's like not in the books, right? Like, it's not bad, but it's not from the books. It's like, you know, gateways look nothing like gateways. All right, so the forced flirting is a thing. Blah, 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 blah. The two people who got the note went with a, went to go back with the last cask of ale and apparently have gotten killed by Masima's people. Yeah, it's sad. She allows them to go back after stealing the note. Like, oh, no, no one noticed us. We'll be safe. And they go back and... No, someone noticed you you are not safe. They they are getting like tarred and feathered or something else equally awful to prove to everyone what comes to liars and thieves and it's it's a very bad scene that I'm glad we don't get to see. But yes, they have disappeared. Uh, we get that Anora wanted to destroy the note, which I okay, maybe that helps Masima, maybe she didn't help it, whatever, we don't get any fucking I we never know. We never get into her head about it. I assume she just wanted to deprive everyone of access to the note, just yeah. as a general yeah. all-purpose pansia. But yeah, it's there's just there's just nothing there in terms of follow through. So, but I assume it was just she was like, oh well, that's a good thing to not exist. So she probably would have just burned it like happily. 
Um, and yeah, Perrin ends the audience because there's nothing more to get out of it, much like how I feel about this chapter. There's just nothing more to get out of it. So I'm going <laughs> to ride my horse off into the snowy sunset. There's, there's a, a quote here. There was one thing he could find out for himself. And I couldn't figure out what he was referring to. Is that <clears throat> much earlier in the chapter? No, it's 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 late. It's like with two, so it starts. The paragraph starts with a taste of food in it. His stomach wanted him to devour the leg in his hand and the rest of the bird too. But he closed the lid firmly and tried to take measured bites. There was one thing he could find out for himself. What else has Anura said about Masima? I guess he's just asking that question. He's not finding out for himself. He's asking the question and being told the answer. But he's not waiting to be told information. He's actually taking enough initiative to ask, which is a big step for a big boy like him. Well, okay. Okay. I, I, I don't know. That's all I've ever gotten from it. It's just like him. He's he's just not in his right mind. And it is frustrating to be relatively not in a state of panic over my spouse while being in the head of someone who is in a state of panic over their spouse. It's like, I'm not relating to why you don't make sense. Right. But Barra Lane finds the whole thing very disturbing. That is uh, maybe the important part is where Perrin is actually sharing information with Barra Lane and actually asking her what she knows and what she thinks and is bringing information mm. to her. She didn't know, which again, he's treating her in a, in a professional wife capacity kind of way. Being like, hey, notes, we should share them. And she's like, oh, oh, I'm going to go ask her what she's what she's doing. And that's, you know, expanding parent circle of information, hopefully. So that's that's good. They're, okay. they're working together slightly. Yeah, that's good. Sure. I'll give you that. He's trying. He's making an effort. Yeah. Again, not the greatest written. No, it, it's not very obvious that that's no. what's going on to me. No. But I, I'm trying hard to find something redeeming about Perrin in this plot because I don't want the podcast to just be a bitch fest. <laughs> Every once in a while it is, but... Um, but, you know, it, I like that he's talking to her, giving her information. It's so rare in these books and it's it's refreshing. Yeah. So I'll find out what Honora is up to, she says. I don't think she ever does. That I know of. No. We never get that follow through. She makes an effort, but it doesn't work because young woman versus Aes Sedai. So he gets back and Aram has basically been telling all about the dark hunt, the great hunt. And of course, everyone's been making fun of him for it because it's like literally like saying children's, yeah, children's tales. tales. And then parents said there are footprints in the stone. And of course, man, everyone's like, oh, oops. Aram's not. But then I just think about Aram, who, like, was already getting dissed by Perrin, gets come back to a bunch of people making fun of him. Like, he's just, he's in a bad place. Public humiliation. He's in a real bad place. Yeah. It's like, dude's going to sort up a caravan. You know? He's going to go, he's, he's, he's going to make bad choices. It's, it's very, mm, he's right there, Perrin. He's right there. Just say something nice to him. If I had any takeaway from these two chapters, it's this is why Aram turned on Perrin. Absolutely. Yeah. This this is per this this is the ending of Aram's origin story phase. This is the ending of the origin part of his villain situation. Yeah. Yep. He, it's just a matter of time until he turns. Yeah, his villain origin on, story yeah. metamorphosis is like and the next chapter will be the Masima cult follower. <laughs> it just it just takes until what knife of dreams until Perrin takes out Molten. Does that happen in this book? I forget. I think it happens in knife. I was of li dreams. I listened to them both I'm in a row. I'm pretty sure it happens in knife of dreams. Yeah. it's like finally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, oh my god, I can't believe it didn't even happen in Crossroads. That's why Crossroads feels like so long. So you're like, we spent all this time on Perrin's plotline, and it doesn't even resolve in that book. You have to wait until Knife of Dreams. It's one of the things that makes Knife of Dreams like it starts out with this huge relief that you've been holding it in for such a long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, let's get into it. So this is 
the return of Lanfear, right? I mean, Sinday. she's been around. Get it right. Sorry. Uh, uh, oh, my God. She's not allowed to use that name anymore. Last chance. I'm sorry I dead named her. You're right. Uh, <laughs> Sinday. But she calls herself Lanfear know, in most of the I rest know. of the books. She, like, doesn't... She, unlike Llewellyn, Shipless, or um, even some of the other forsaken when they're brought back they embrace a, the new name they're given mm -hmm. lanfear is like no fuck you dark one i'm still lanfear yeah fuck i'm not <laughs> sindane chance you know which you know if if the newly revealed lanfear lives um information is correct which we kind of have to assume it is coming from the mouth of the author you know she defied the dark one and got away with it well i do approve of de defying satan Broadly yes. speaking, like when incarnate evil tells you that you can't have something and then you have it anyway, I am broadly in support of that. But also... Ugh. Do you want to read the whole POV chunk? Um, I mean, I guess so. They're all just so short. Right. Well, I kind of like the idea of that if you listen to all these episodes, you can actually get almost the entire cleansing uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, read out loud to you. Ooh, I could do that as a compilation after. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we read all of the brand POV in the beginning because no, that was a long one. We didn't. Yeah, but I I could put this together as a compilation once we're done, at least for patrons. Oh, that'd be a good. Pa yeah, that would be a good Patreon reward. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, okay. So basically, we are going to join Sindane as she discovers as the as the cleansing starts. She feels the cleansing kick off and immediately responds to it, and that is where we're hopping in. If you are truly one of the chosen, I will serve you, the bearded man in front of Sindane said doubtfully, but she did not hear what else he had to say. She could feel it. That much of Sidar being drawn to one spot was a beacon that any woman in the world who could channel would feel and locate. So he had found a woman to use the other access key. She would have faced the great lord, faced the creator, with him. She would have shared the power with him, let him rule the world at her side, and he had spurned her love, spurned her. The fool babbling at her was an important man as such things were accounted here and now, but she did not have time to make certain of his trustworthiness, and without that, she could not leave him to babble, not when she could feel Moradin's hand caressing the corsuvra that held her soul. A razor-thin flow of air sliced the fellow's beard in two as it took off his head. Another flow shoved the body backward so the blood fountaining from the stub of his neck did not spot her dress. Before a body or head hit the stone floor, she had spun her gateway, a beacon she could point to, beckoning her. As she stepped into rolling forest where scattered carpets of snow littered the ground beneath stark branches bare save for the thick ropes of drooping brown vines, she wondered where the beacon had drawn her. It did not matter. South of her, that beacon shone, enough Sidar to lay waste to a continent in one blow. He would be there, him and whoever the woman was he had betrayed her with. Carefully, she drew on the power to spin a web for his death. Oh, she's so mean. I love her. Oh, yeah. That slicing of the beard to get to the neck was always an image that stuck with me in these in these books, right? Mm. That that method of killing was so very Lanfear. And then just, like, pushing the body away so she doesn't get any blood on her. Just like, ew. That's the part that <laughs> stuck like, with me, but, was the part yeah. where she immediately flings up a wall to keep it from getting on her dress. That was always the part that just was like, oh, boy, she's cold. <laughs> <laughs> the very cold. Very cold. Old. Just slice and dice, and for no reason other than, you know, she he was new and she wasn't sure of his loyalty yet, and he was inconvenient at the time. Yeah, it would be too, it would take too much time to wrap up this loose end, so she would rather kill him. It's just like, this is why you shouldn't sell yourself over to the Forsaken, is because they do not care about you at all. The Dark One doesn't care in the slightest. No. And uh, you think he's going to resurrect your ass just because you got in Lanfear's way? No. No. This, okay, one of the things I was thinking about while you're reading that is, what do you think the people in Shara are thinking I right was thinking now, that right? too as I was reading it. I'm like, <laughs> why did the Sharans never show up? You'd think they would send right. some, like, you know, sentenced to death channelers or something to, like, check it out or, or some scientists, like... 
May, maybe they just don't have the gateways yet. The Demondred is the only one who has the gateway, and that's how they appear in the last be at that battle. That the gateways. Gateways only exist with Rand and and the Forsaken. That mm, mm. that's a weak sauce argument. Gateways should exist. They shouldn't have been lost. I don't understand how gateways could possibly have gotten lost. That seems like way too useful of a weave. But whatever. That that's got to be it. That's got to be the reason. People on the road traveling every day never settle down long enough to use it. Forget how. Oh, that's my theory. That's actually a really good point with the way the surface of the world was warping. Like, if you never can, like, you can't open a gateway to anywhere because nowhere exists that you've ever been because it's all been destroyed. How do you know where to go? How do you know where something is? If it's changing faster than you can learn it. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Okay, all right, all right. I guess that is good world building. Also, unexpected death and teachers. Like, you just sort of expect weird things to get lost because everyone who knew it happened to die in the same avalanche at the same time. And you're just like, oh, well, now we don't know gateways anymore. Fuck. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, that's true. How does knowledge get lost? So fucking easily. Uh, very true. <laughs> yeah, way too easily. <laughs> Disturbingly easily. <laughs> So um, I wanted to ask, between this POV and the next, do we think that this is the same instance of a woman channeling that gets attacked? Because she says that south of her, the beacon shines. And if I'm not completely confused, which I usually am about geography, is Shadar Logoth north of the spot that they're sitting? Oh, gosh. I, I believe so, but I would have to go check the exact geography of exactly where they set up next Shadow Logoth. Um, I think it's in the beginning of the chapter. If we go back and read Rand's POV, he's like, to the south or to of... of... That's what I thought. I, I need to know because the gateway he wove was to a thinly wooded uneven hilltop a few miles to the north. Can I say we found that almost I the identical moment? Nerds. <laughs> we are on the same wavelength. We were both thinking about Shara. We both got to the same spot at the same time. Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, we, may, we, may, we may have been doing this for a while. <laughs> um, speaking of which, we had our six-year anniversary. We did. We did. Happy sixth birthday to us. Right. That's in the past now for those of you who are listening to this. But, um, you know, recent history for us, which is very exciting. Yeah, we're recording this on the 25th, and that was on the 21st. So, yeah. 19th. 19th? Right. 20th? 21st? No, 21st. You're right. Timber's birthday is the 19th. That's what's oh, on the 19th. Yeah. Happy birthday to Timber. Yeah, he's eight now. For oh, those of you who, uh, who have been listening, right? Because he was three when the podcast started. So he was barely out of his puppy phase. And now he is solidly into middle age. But he's still my puppy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. So, yeah, springtime, a time of birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So when she shows up, she is looking... No, she's looking south of her, and they are north of the city. So she's farther north of them? Yes. So they, the city is the southernmost point. Then north of them is Rand, and then north of them is Lanfear. Basically, she's coming in outside the bullseye. Okay. And coming in on foot, yeah. So the, the thing that Cad Swain feels then is not Lanfear. In the next POV, she feels something and points towards Shadar Logoth and directs her next bolt that direction. And I assumed it was Lanfear, and that's why I wanted to get this geography right, because it's not. No, it doesn't appear to be. And honestly, that makes sense, that because Lanfear arrives in the forest, not in a city. Yeah. So. And this also seems like uh, Sidin, not Sidar. Oh, does her shrike only do... Yeah, that's my understanding. Uh... She also points to the north earlier in that section. So that might be Lanfear. There's a thing at the end that that's what I was interested in. But now I'm like literally reading ahead. And as soon as the word left her mouth, the fountain of flame erupted in the forest to the north. So she pointed north, which is the way Lanfear was. And that's with the golden bird, the swallow. Yes. And then, and then the swallow also turns towards Shadow Logos. So the Swallow must detect both or detects a woman in Shadow Logos. I thought the Swallow just detected men channeling. Oh, no, it says or whether by a man or a woman. So 
That would, yeah, it, it can detect either, certainly. Okay. So it's entirely possible that she does, in fact, notice Lanfear and then notice somebody else. I mean, they are getting surrounded and attacked by multiple Forsaken. Oh, and I'm, I'm looking ahead. So the next POV after after Cad Swain is Rand, but then the one after that is Demon Dread, and he does arrive in Shadow Logoth. Mm. So the one that we're reading today, the first one is pointed at the POV we're reading today, and then the second one is pointed at the POV we're reading in two weeks. No, in one week, because we're doing two back-to-back double headers. So I will also read a note about the Golden Swallow that's on Encyclopedia Watt. And it says it cites the Glimmer's Q&A. There's a link there. The Golden Swallow was made during the breaking to detect a man channeling alone. Since a man linked to a woman was by definition safe, it does not detect Sidene linked to Sidar. However, that doesn't specify whether it detects Sidar by itself or not. It just says it. So that's why it's not basically turning around and detecting the allies that are channeling, I think, is what he was trying to say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That makes sense. Because they're linked. That makes sense. Just an interesting note I found there. And feel free to follow up with that. But it sounds like it's from just a Q&A with Robert Jordan. But yeah, I think I think it's important for us to, as we do this thing, is to keep in mind, yeah, that bullseye you were talking about. Where in the bullseye are various Forsaken showing up and existing? If the center of the bullseye is Shadar Logoth and the first ring out yes. is our crew, where else is everyone showing up? And our crew is more or less due north. Of Shadow Logos ish. Mm -hmm. So 12 o'clock on the right, right. And so Lanfear has arrived even farther north, more or less on the same line. That's a good way of thinking about it and giving us a little little battle map. I just am really bad with the spatiality of my fantasy books, and podcasting makes me want to be good at it. So that's all I have to say about that POV. And do you want to? Move on to the next one. Oh, just that I think this is um, he who shall follow after right here, right? Kalandor shone like a flame in young Jahar hands. This is Narishma using Kalandor after Rand has used it. Okay. This, this is... I think that, that you can make a really good argument that this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. I mean, he does admirably well with Kalandor. He really makes Kalandor awesome and work for him. And he uses it correctly, correctly, linked with two women, right? That's what makes it possible. So, you know, I, th- I, th- I think there's a really good argument to be made that this is where that happens. And that's that's a totally valid, like, he uses the most powerful, well, not the most powerful, but the craziest, <laughs> <laughs> most important, most important Zagreal, put, put it that way, of the age. And that that could be enough. Because nobody else, as far as we know, uses it. Yeah. Yeah. I just also want to point out that we are at the early stages of the battle as far as, like, that that confident phase in the battle when you're like, oh, my shields are like, that was a big hit, but, like, I'm holding, you know? Like, Catswain's kind of measuring the strength of her tools and realizing she's already needing her artifacts in order to withstand the onslaught, but they're doing good. She's, like, pointing and things are blasting. She's got the shield, like... She's her hair is not disheveled yet, you know. Everyone's still cool. The ship is still right. operating smoothly. It's just the morning. They also don't know exactly how long they have to do this for. Right, right. Um, and so this is like okay, for hour one, let's go. We're in a fight. People are popping up. There's someone popped up in the, to the north of us. Someone's popping up in the city. All right, let's send some fire out to harass them. You know, which we see is pretty effective later. Very, yeah. We see the Forsaken being quite irritated by having to run away from fire every time they land somewhere. But yeah, it's it's just they're very confident. We're like, okay, good. Rand walked into this battle correctly prepared in terms of allies. The allies are able to do their job. And like, there's some weird warder, eyes to die dynamic stuff that I don't really care about. But battle wise, that's the stage that that we're at. And that takes us out of Winter's Heart for today. And back. Forward to and a back. Crossroads of Twilight. <laughs> and forward and back. Forward and back. The way back will come, but what every week. What is that week, from? Uh, oh, right. From forward and back <laughs> is the glass hall. <laughs> right, right, right. Of course. Of course. Yeah.
It's so ingrained into me. I, I thought it was a pop culture uh, it reference. It is a pop culture reference how- because for us, it is popular culture. <laughs> Normalcy is defined by statistical normality. Like it is popular mm-hmm. with us. Mm-hmm. That's statistically mm-hmm. true. We are statistically the best fandom. For some reason, I thought it was Farscape because they. I don't know why. I, I, I can't help you. Farscape's not my wheelhouse. I'm actually kind of surprised about that. Because you've told me about it like 18 times. Yes, it is reasonable for you to be surprised about it. But nonetheless, here we are. Nonetheless, you still don't like it. I still haven't bothered. We still haven't bothered. Yeah. I just, fiction is not doing it for me. I, ju- I just. That's fair. I, I want to learn about the, the real world is stranger than fiction and more complicated. And there's so much fucking canon. You have any idea how much canon there is if you want to learn about the real world? Ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I got totally overwhelmed and said, no, nope, I'm out. I mean, I'm talking like archaeology and and stuff like I'm not at all. Well, that's not true. I've actually been really interested in this podcast about the history of Ukraine, but mostly for the historical stuff. I'm I just I'm I've been on a history bender because Brandon has been. So people asked earlier how Brandon's doing. I don't know if I ever said Brandon's doing great. Um, His his recovery, his surgery went great and his recovery has been going great. But because he's all on pain meds and in pain, I have absolute free reign to just play all the podcasts and l- watch all the YouTube things. So I have been falling down some serious history rabbit holes on YouTube while Brandon just sort of dozes in the recliner. He's learning all kinds of weird things about Neolithic farming because that's, I can't do fiction, but I can do archaeology. It's just where my brain's at. I can end with one end. <laughs> you have to think of the real world as a fictional world I'm trying to learn and it becomes a lot easier mm-hmm. see where I, I went wrong is I tried to learn how the real world works and so I got really deep into the, like the engineering of stuff oh. and that, that, that took you down no, the no, math no. rabbit hole and yeah like I, I, it, there's just too much you can't I mean history I also think is like that's more like broad is, you know, because you can learn about only so much about each topic, I feel like. But there's infinite number of mm-hmm. topics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, it's an infinity number of things you can do at the armchair level and, like, never run out of material for that armchair level. I mean, if you want to go farther, you have to get, like, a degree or something. But, like, historians love talking on the Internet about their stuff. So, like, <laughs> like the, I've been listening to a really cool series about Ukraine that is a Yale course. It's literally just a Yale course that got filmed and is is just available for free. So it's just a Yale lecture. Like historians love sharing their shit. They're like no one listens to us. Please listen to us. So <laughs> stop repeating your mistakes. <laughs> listen to us, please. Yeah, it's one of those like you know you know what like the concepts that like scientists have a big conspiracy or a big secret or anything is ridiculous. Because scientists are like, will not shut up about the things that right. they love. Yeah, they'll t- they'll tell like, you exactly. No. <laughs> they will tell you exactly what they think all the time and for free in front of an audience, not in front of an yeah, audience. They're dying. We yeah. are dying at the dinner to table talk about in front of their family. Dump, yeah. We're de- dying to do it. So yeah, the concept that scientists have a giant conspiracy to keep secrets is is, is laughable. <laughs> The podcast was invented by a scientist's wife to get him to go talk about his uh, discoveries somewhere else. (laughs) Canon accepted. Hey, canon accepted. Okay, so yeah, hi everyone. We've been gone for one entire week, and um, without getting into a lot of detail, basically just my warder had to have a little injury repair surgery, and so that has necessarily disrupted everything, because now I'm in care ca- caregiver, caretaker mode, and it's just been a lot. So that's why I took last week off, was because, yeah, he's he had to go in and let the yellow Aja do some of their most advanced weaves. And now he has to hang by his foot at all times, right? Yes. That's, that was my understanding. Yes, he has to hang upside down in the rigging by his foot. That is the prescribed right. uh, next forever, basically. I may have gotten that slightly wrong. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> Elevated foot and all that jazz. So yeah, he's he's pretty incapacitated, it sounds like. Yeah. For a little yeah, while. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to be, I'm getting my steps in. 
Let's put it that way. I am getting my steps in because I have to get everything for him. Um, but everyone, thank you for your patience. And I know that any yellow Aja weaves you'd like to direct to this corner of the Pacific Northwest would be well received. Yeah, thank you for your patience while we weren't here last week. Hopefully you took the opportunity to go try out an awesome new podcast like Watt in Color or The Lights Work or catch up on a podcast that's excellent like Wheel Takes. Hopefully, maybe you listened to well, Idol. I don't know. Hopefully, you did something else cool with your time that you were going to give to us. And now we're back. So, yeah, with two chapters and two POVs, we managed to stretch that out to two hours. That's, <laughs> that's how much there was to get through. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, and there's a couple of unanswered questions, but it's it's... Sometimes it's hard when there's nothing, no follow up and no, it's like, yeah, the question got asked and we can point out the question, but when there's no follow up information or no relevant, nothing to cross reference, it's like, yep, I guess that, 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 I guess those dark hounds went that way. Don't, don't know where they went. Don't know who they ended up with. Fane seems to be the best answer I can find on the internet, but not necessarily a definitive one. Yeah. So... Thank you to everyone who listened and enjoyed this meandering wander through the snow <laughs> of our discontent. Uh, we will be joining you next week for a- another doubleheader of Perrin stuff because that's the mode we're in for the moment. Everyone who is on the fence about going to WatCon, please hop on off that fence on the side of coming because we want to meet all of you. And watching Jordan Con happen on Twitter just makes me all the more assured that you don't want to miss out on the shenanigans in Columbus, Ohio, July 14th, 15th, and 16th. And if you haven't bought tickets, but you still intend to, you're two weeks behind me because this comes out in two weeks. So, ha. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, and we should definitely mention congratulations to Rob Malkier Talks and Grace Bain and Chia totally. from the Lights Work because they got freaking wreathified. They got me they, they had engaged. <laughs> so, oh, so cute. Okay, okay, I had to work, so I could I haven't watched anything from I'm honestly so out of Jordan Con news. Um I don't even I, I I only know what you've told me, which is that they got engaged. Yeah, so they made a post that um, that she offered a wreath and he said yes. And there was like a literal wreath. Oh. And um, yeah, so I, I, I just I was intermittently keeping up with Jordan Con throughout the weekend. But um, of course, the entirety of Twitter of time has melted down like a bunch of people who are like longtime members of the community were like witnesses to the actual event and have chimed in with like, Oh my God, I got to be there. It was so sweet. Um, but yeah, I mean, Rob and Grace met through the community and I think this is, this mm -hmm. is now the second couple I know of who is going all the way who met within the community because of the wheel of time content creator swirling space of, Hey, let's all get together and realize we aren't alone in our love of these books. Like, Oh my God. Uh. And, and I mean, Rob has done so much to make spoiler con happen over the years to um, obviously create Malcure talks to make other really interesting and important things happen in the community. Um, and Grace has been a presence on Twitter and at Jordan Con and at the other cons. And, and now she's doing the Lights Work podcast with Anas from the Dusty Wheel. Oh. Oh, so they okay. are doing a podcast. I'm not, whew, okay, I'm not keeping so, up with them anymore. I'm not even keeping up with the new ones. <laughs> yeah. So the Lights Work is a podcast by Grace and Anas from the Dusty Wheel, which is about the fandom. It's a podcast just about oh, the okay. fandom and all of the things we do that are the Lights Work. It's a very sweet podcast. Got you. It's all about making you cry happy tears. Um, it's very, very sweet. I'm super behind on it, but it's a really fun, sweet. If you ever just want to like feel like your friends are with you and you're just feeling that like loneliness, listen to the lights work because more than any other podcast, it's going to remind okay. you of like all the vibes. Um, but I'm hearing in, in chat that, um, apparently it was a whole thing. It was like a scavenger hunt that she made for him to like find. Like, there was a scavenger hunt of all the moments they had shared at JordanCon last year, and she'd literally lay a wreath down. And, like, it was apparently, like, a whole thing. I'm, I'm hearing from from chat from people who were there. So Oh, and she's also the one who knocked us out of... Yes. Uh... 
Why Idol last year? Why yes, Idol yes. Last Our year, song tribute yes. lost to Grace's extremely creepy, cute Land Fear song, and she did a song from the same album this year uh, in Why Idol, and it was just as good. I loved it even more. Um, it went just as far in the in the contest. Um, yeah, no, they are both some of the most delightful, sweet people. Um, I've gotten to meet them both in person because Rob came to WatCon last year, which was super, super cool. And Grace did too. And I, I'm just so happy for them. There was a lot of cool stuff that happened at JordanCon, but like, I mean, there was an engagement at WatCon last year, but I didn't know the people. So it was very sweet to witness, right, but I was just right. one of the people who was blindsided by it. Whereas last year at WatCon, it was like, oh, this is the first time that Grace and Rob have really gotten to hang out, like in person. They're obviously really sweet on each other. Oh my God, they're so cute. And now to hear that they're engaged in the best I yield fashion and with all of the wheel of time community around for it is just like, Oh my God. Congratulations. You two. That's so sweet. I don't know if you listen to this podcast, but I'm saying it anyway. Like, you're Oh yeah, to me. no, it's absolutely. I was excited when I heard they were first dating and I'm, I'm super excited that they're engaged and the end. Uh, are they, they're not living in the same area, right? This, are they doing they're not living in the same country. This, Rob lives right, in the UK. Right. That's what I meant by area. Um, I right. and don't she's... actually know where she's from. Um, not the UK, though. Okay. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming the right, US, the US Canada, somewhere. Because that's where everyone is from. If they're not yeah. from the UK or Australia. Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Massachusetts, I'm yeah. Um, so I have no idea how they're going to, to, to manage that. But the Dragon Wall is, has already been crossed in their hearts. So, you know, it's right, just yeah. details <laughs> from here. <laughs> We have planes. Unfortunately, no gateways. Yeah. Oh, and apparently like, the wreath was like made of flowers that like actually had like the proper meanings. And like then Grace let people like pluck flowers from it to like press into their books or whatever as keepsakes. Like, oh, my God, the lights work is just absurd. And like Anas, I don't know how Anas is going to manage to hold it together because Anas is just very sweet and such good friends with Grace. And like, I don't know how they're going to talk about this without just making everyone like literally drown in their own tears. God, the wedding is going to be absurd. The amount of live streaming into the various discords. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I hope they're planning it for a con. So that way a bunch of people already have travel plans. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, wow. we're, gonna, we're gonna have to figure out well, uh, yeah that's gonna like be Mount interesting Con, i guess is just gonna be the wedding like, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like do I, need to get my, I need to get my passport figured out like oh jesus yeah <sighs> uh yeah so that's i feel like i had other lovely news in the fandom i wanted to share but um that's just really what how can how can you beat that i mean we got a winner for what idol i don't know if you talked about that Oh, did we? Did we talk about what Idol? Was, has what Idol happened since we last recorded? Yeah, because we skipped. Oh weeks. shit! We haven't talked about what Idol. Okay, well, um, yeah, that happened. Uh, yep, we got knocked out. What in round two? We made it th- at least through the first round of voting. We made it one round of voting farther than last year, but we were still knocked out in the first overall round we made it through like the half prelim right. but then got knocked out um and it, it was, was really so close. close we like, were I, we were it was, a, yeah it was, it was so close i got it was 50 yeah. 50 51 49 and back it went back and forth a couple of times before i think it finally ended up at like 48 52 or something like that percentages yeah it um, made me way more depressed than when we got like completely clobbered last year <laughs> like right, yeah. it was way harder to be like we're winning oh no we're not like it was easier to just be roundly knocked out than to be that like hair like i had a much harder time being a good loser with the margin being that close <laughs> i remember yeah you, know, <laughs> you were not you had a moment where you're like i'm gonna kill yeah, him <laughs> I was, and like absolutely no shade to who we but, lost uh, to it's just watching no, no, yeah, that yeah, yeah, was no, so no, it doesn't hard. matter who we lost to yeah yeah just the oh my god i can't believe it's that close uh yeah so so brutal but um the song that won ultimately was like the first year it was a wild card entry it was a song that had originally lost in its initial voting and had gotten brought back from wild card voting. Mm-hmm. So that was a nice callback to year one. Because that was Master of the Deck, right? Who won? The song was Master of the Deck. Yeah. Um, and I've decided I figured out the, 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 the critical thing that all three entries have in common, aside from the person being white. It's all the person playing their own instrument. 
that's the other thing that all three of them have in common is it's one per- one voice, one instrument, and they do both. The pian- the piano this year, I mean, it wasn't one shot. Obviously, it was several different takes, whereas year one and two, it was a one shot situation. Master of the Decks was clearly cut together, but nonetheless, the instrumentation was something she produced herself. And so I'm convinced that that's going to be how we have to win. We have to, we can't be using karaoke music. We got to use our own music. Um, all right. Well, I think I need to get going. There's stuff going on in my house and we're a little bit over. Let's kill recording. Right. Thank you everyone so, for listening and hanging out yeah. for the after show Thank you, and everyone. follow us on, on social media. I'll probably have more announcements next time. Peace out. Thank you for listening to the wheel of time spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?